Welcome to the Revolution Church Podcast. Before we begin, we'd like to remind you that our ministry is supported 100% by listeners like you. To make your 100% tax-deductible donation today, please visit revolutionchurch.com slash donate. You can also learn more by clicking the donate section on the website. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Revolution, or should I say welcome Revolution to you wherever you're at. Um, As always, thanks for having Revolution in your ears. Um, I have been hinting at an announcement that we I wanted to make an announcement and that we've been working on some new things for Revolution. And it looks like that has now finally come uh, come to fruition, maybe. Um, Starting in April 2nd, we will be meeting again at Bryant Lake Bowl, and we'll be starting to have services at 11 a.m., so I'm officially in my 40s now that Revolution is meeting at 11 a.m. Um, but yeah, that's the announcement. We are going to be having in, uh, in-person services again. I won't just be recording from my home studio, and i uh, really excited about that. So if you're in the Minnesota area or have friends in the Minnesota area, please let them know Starting April 2nd, Revolution will be meeting at Bryant Lake Bowl um, at 11 a.m. And we have the room for a couple hours, so we'll be able to have a service and hopefully some time to hang out and chat and uh, get to know each other. Uh, Community, I believe it's called. Um, But I just want to thank all of you who've been listening um, and stuck with us through all... uh, through the through the times of not being uh, having a physical service, it means a lot to me that this church is that important to you, and that you've been here uh, the whole time. And I hope you continue to stick with Revolution uh, through service times. And you know who knows what happens next. But we just you know one day at a time or one week at a time, and uh, keep seeing what's going to happen. So yeah, back at the bowling alley, back in the gutter. Um, today, uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, I always say favorite verses, so I'm going to stop because, but I do have a few particular verses that I use a lot, but, um, today I'm going to talk about Jesus as being a friend and what Jesus was, a, who Jesus was a friend of, dot, 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 um, and what that meant. So if you're following along Mark, we're going to be in Mark 2, um, 15, I'm sorry, Mark 2, 13. Jesus went again beside the sea. The whole crowd gathered around him and he taught them. As he was walking along, he saw Levi, son of Alphas, sitting at his tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Now first I'm going to stop for a second and say that there's a whole sermon there. Jesus walking up to the tax collector and saying, follow me. I mean, it's a big deal, but that's not today's sermon. But kind of is and kind of isn't, but that's a big deal. 15 goes on to say, And he sat in dinner at Levi's house. Many tax collectors and sinners were also sitting with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors. They said to his disciples, Why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus told, heard this, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick have I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Um People always say, well, we don't want to be sinners. We don't want to be known as sinners. You know, and Jesus is saying, these are the people I've come to call. So I, I want to think about that for a second. Um, this happens again in Luke. Uh, Luke 15 starts out 1 and 2. Now all Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. Uh, Because to eat with them was to build a covenant and to say that you were 
in covenant together. It wasn't like just having a, a dinner nowadays. So this was a big deal. Um, but why did I want to read this? Is because I, I sometimes I think people go like, you know, Jesus didn't have a lot of friends or Jesus, you know, was so righteous and, and kept people away. And it seemed to be the people that Jesus ostracized most were religious people. Um, so if you're ostracizing people who are not religious, you're probably not doing the same thing Jesus did. That's just how it goes. If you're just like trying in all these right living, well put together, perfect people, then you're probably not Christ-like. If you're bringing in people who want to kill each other, who are infighting, who are messed up, uh, who who have have issues, then you might be doing what Jesus did. I wanted to read from uh, f- f- from this book um, called Unapologetic. It's written by this guy Francis Spufford, and it's called Unapologetic. Why, despite everything, Christianity can still make surprising emotional sense. Now, I'll admit, I picked up this book because sometimes Christianity doesn't make sense to me. Sometimes my faith doesn't make sense to me. And I need to read things to encourage that. Um, So, yeah. It's okay if you don't like it. I ain't mad at you. But this is a book I've just started reading, so I'm only on the second chapter. So I'm not saying, go out and buy this book. I'm just saying I just started reading it, but I'm going to read a little bit from it in a second. But one of the verses uh, in Mark 2, uh, 13 and 17, in the New Living Translation, which is the translation I first started really reading the Bible in, says, you know, why does your teacher eat with such scum? (laughs) I always thought that was interesting. And he goes, I've come to call sinners, not those who think they're good enough. I always liked that translation and the way it said, not those who think they're good enough. And I think that's the idea here is that we have people who are unwilling to admit their brokenness. You know, they think they're okay. They don't mess things up. Um, And I was reading this book, uh, Unapologetic, and Francis uh, Spufford's uh, kind of concept of sin, and I really liked it, and so I figured I'd read it to you. There's all sorts of different ideas, and this is just one, but I, for now, let's read this. It's our active inclination to break stuff. Stuff here, including moods, promises, relationships we care about, and our own well-being, and other people's, as well as material objects whose high gloss positively seem to invite a big fat scratch. Now I hope we're on common ground. In the end, almost everyone recognizes this one truth about themselves. You can get, you can get quite a long way through adult life without having to acknowledge your own personal prosticity to etc etc maybe even all the way through if you're someone who's very high threshold of obliviousness or one with a kind of disposition of regis- <laughs> that registers sunshine even when the storm is howling all around but for most of us the point eventually arrives when the least for an hour or a day or a season we find we have to take notice of our and he calls it HPTFTU just basically that we're messed up. I'll let you figure out what that means. I'm going to read more about that. But the idea is here, and just to read this a little bit again, is it's our active inclination to break stuff here, including moods, promises, relationships we care about. As human beings, we don't naturally take care of things or take care of other people or aren't naturally aware of our actions and uh, what those actions, what the reaction can be and what the cause is from anything from just, you know, 
maybe we hurt people's feelings without knowing about it to, you know, to products that we buy that may be putting other people in harm, uh, you know, supporting sweatshops, things like that. We, you know, we, it's all over the place. Usually we want to have sin as this sexual thing or drinking and drugs and partying and good times. Um, but what we really don't think about it is that it's usually hurting other people, hurting ourselves. And I think what we have here is Jesus is saying, you know, I've come to call people who realize they have this tendency, not those who think that they don't. Um, and Jesus was with those people. And helping those people realize that. Because when you realize that, that's when you can you can not become perfect. No one's perfect. But you can work on those things and you can start to fix those things in your life. The book goes on further to say, Our appointment with realization often comes at one of the classic moments of adult failure. When marriage ends, when career stalls or crumbles, when relationships fade away with the child seen only on Saturdays, when the supposedly recreational coke habit turns out to be exercising veto power over every other hope and dream. It need not be dramatic, though it can equally well just be the drifting into a place of one more pleasant, indistinguishable little atom of wasted time, one more morning, like all the others, which quickly discloses you to yourself. You know, there's moments in time in life where we come and realize we're not perfect. The dream didn't come true. We're not living the life that maybe we thought we would live. We hurt people that we don't mean to hurt because we can't seem to master things at life. Relationships are tough. Marriage is tough. Parenting is tough. You know, the whole gambit. We're all somehow broken. And this is who Jesus spent time with. This is the idea of why the Pharisees seemed threatening to people is because they were in a, in a way able to act as though those things didn't matter to them. And a lot of the Gentiles didn't have that privilege. You know, they didn't go to the schools to become Pharisees. They weren't in that protected world, you know, uh, Jesus hung out with tax collectors and prostitutes and, you know, prostitutes don't become prostitutes usually because they're sex crazed people is because they find them in a situation where they need a job. They need help. They need work. They're in desperate need of something. So in tax collectors, I guess, you know, it's the same thing. <laughs> Poor tax collectors. They're never going to be popular. Uh, going to see the tax collectors kind of like going to see the dentist. But scarier. Um, but this is who Jesus is a friend of. Jesus is a friend of people who are broken and messed up and know it. And if you don't know it, I guess this would be a time to realize, hey, we all mess up. You know, there was a reason that in the when I was a kid that there was even commercials. I remember these commercials of uh, people littering, and at the end it had a crying Native American. And, you know, thinking of the fact that there was a time where there had to be commercials to tell people, stop throwing garbage on the ground. You know, stop destroying <laughs> the area around you. Stop trashing the planet. And now we're realizing that we've gone even further than we thought. You know, but the inkling is that, you know, we were just human beings and going, oh, well, we're garbage. We just throw it here. Someone else will take care of it. Something will happen. You know, we don't need it. Just I was watching an episode of Mad Men and they were having a picnic. And at the end of the picnic, the guy stands up and he just throws all the garbage on the ground and they just take the blanket and walk off, you know, and that's how it was. You know, um, there were also, remember as a kid, commercials about not smoking because it can make you sick. 
and not doing crack. You know, and that's funny is, you know, we needed these public announcements to say, hey, there are these things that hurt you and are hurting others and that are hurting people and are hearing communities. And you need to not do these things because they're dangerous. So here's just a recommendation that maybe these things are bad. And, you know, here's a reminder in between your, you know, watching a team or the Smurfs um, or, you know, that's what I was watching as a kid, you know the fall guy or night rider. But anyhow, we screw things up. It's our nature. And that's part of being broken. That's part of being a sinner. And I think that's a different definition of it than most of us think about or that the church is withheld. But this is the type of people that Jesus was friends of and this is what Jesus was called to. You know, and uh, I find that very interesting. So sit with that. Let that, think about that. You know, maybe discuss it here on, well not here, but maybe discuss it on Facebook or Twitter. Let me know what you think about it. This is not a not a sermon with a bow. This is just a talk about what meant to be Jesus, a friend of sinners, and knew that people were messed up. We were messed up and we're broken. And maybe taking the word sinner back and not making it become such a hideous, horrid thing that we've turned it into being like a deviant, you know, is that all sin, all fall short. But yet God in his gracious kindness declares us not guilty. That's what the Bible says. And uh, realizing that. Otherwise it can become a weapon and it becomes an us and them thing. And uh, people start to think that why does he, why do they eat with those people? And that's the danger that we have to avoid is that we don't become that, that we don't become exclusive somehow to thinking that because we have something because we have god uh, that god's on our side and that we've got it together or that we've got all the answers and that the other people don't because that's not who jesus spent time with that's not the people who jesus were drawn to or jesus was drawn to and drawn to jesus it was sinners thanks for listening this is revolution church